Thanks, Jeremiah. Turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Praise the Lord for everyone that was able to come out Wednesday night and hear Dr. Jim Shetler. And I know that was a blessing to you. Thank you, church family, for your response, uh, your reception and response to preaching. And I know he jumped from the same verse. We're going to stick here. And uh, the Lord has us to have some time here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And actually, I want you to bring your eyes back up to verse 13. Now, the chapter divisions are there for our benefit so that we can kind of identify scripture. They, they do break. There is a logical order. But I, I do want to encourage you as you read your Bible to read through the chapter divisions. And maybe if your Bible reading plan has you stop at a certain spot. Read a verse or two in the next spot. You're, there's something there in the connection between those verses there. Or, or as you begin some Bible reading, maybe go back a verse or two to help develop the context and see the thoughts that are happening. As Paul finishes, or as we come to, the, come to the conclusion of the thoughts of chapter 13, Paul is really shifting the gears towards the believers at Thessalonica living holy in their life. Now look what the Bible says there in verse 13, and then our text is verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. The Bible says this, To this end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Furthermore, continuation of the thought, more to say about this topic of holiness. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For, we, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the, by the Lord Jesus. Now he's going to go on for the next couple of verses, and this will be our next sermon, where he deals specifically with sexual immorality. And we'll be dealing with that in a sermon to come up in the, in, in the next sermon up in the series. But look down in verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Beloved, God has called you to holiness in your life. And we're going to preach about that this morning. The title of my message is Determined to Live Holy in an Unholy World. Determined to Live Holy in an Unholy World. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is crystal clear. Lord, we thank you that it gives us the instruction, the command, but also the know-how and the knowledge, Lord, that we would live practically holy before you. Lord, I pray that our church and that these brethren, these believers, Lord, would desire to live holy lives. Lord, holiness is not old-fashioned. Lord, holiness is not for a bygone era. God, you are holy. And you call your people to be holy. And Lord, I pray that you would impress upon us, particularly now in this season in our church family, as we come to the very brink, the precipice, the, the beginning of a revival season. Lord, that you would impress upon our hearts and our minds the need for personal holiness in our lives. Lord, even in the preparation of this sermon, and even coming up to the moments of this hour of preaching, Lord, your Holy Spirit has been working. Lord, thank you for the work that you've done in my own life. Lord, as you've impressed these thoughts in my heart and mind. And Lord, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, your Holy Spirit is already working in this congregation. Lord, the topic of holiness can strike a chord, Lord, when we're not living for you. And Lord, undoubtedly, there are some of your children that are already thinking, oh, no. Lord, I pray that we would have a yielded spirit. Lord, that we would hear your word, allow it to be the medicine that it is in our lives. Lord, understanding that you have your, our best intention, 
And Lord, that you desire that you love us and that you are tender with us. And Lord, I pray that this morning we would just hear from you and what you say in your word. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. The Thessalonians lived in a pagan world. It was a wealthy city that was hospitable to every god and every vice but Christianity. They were open to anything, and they enjoyed everything. This enjoyment included the public immorality that often accompanied paganism. The worship of many gods was often uh, centered around human sexuality and depravity, and even te temple worship was immoral worship. And this is what marked this city. For all intents and purposes, it was a sin city of sorts. And in the midst of oppressive wickedness, you remember these Thessalonians, these, this, these believers at Thessalonica were the theme we talked about being determined because they were under intense pressure. And Paul was concerned that they would crumble under the pressure. And not only were they under intense pressure from the religious right, if we want to say that, the, the legalistic Pharisees that, that were not going to allow Christ and, and the grace and salvation through Christ alone to be preached. They were also under intense pressure by their culture, the ungodliness in their culture. And in the midst of oppressive wickedness, Paul exhorts them to walk in holiness. Beloved, we can understand the plight of the Thessalonian believers. We live in an immoral country. We live in the midst of immorality that is celebrated, advertised, publicized, and put on exhibit all around us. Believers today are criticized for attempting to live holy lives. You feel the pressure every single day to not live a holy life. And yet in the midst of this oppression, Paul exhorts the believers at Thessalonica to walk in holiness. What do we mean by holiness? Holiness simply means separation from sin. Separation from sin. God is holy because there is no sin in him. Actually, the Bible says that God's holiness is actually beautiful. His beauty is his holiness. And yet the Apostle Peter reminds us, be, it reminds us of the words of the Lord, be ye holy for I am holy. And beloved, it's not old-fashioned, it's biblical for God's people to live holy lives. Holy lives to what standard? To the standard of who God is and what, you, what he has revealed about himself to us in his word. Now as we jump into this idea, this topic of holiness, let me set the stage here a little bit. And Dr. Shuttler kind of did it with, with some chairs up here. But what we are... There, there's some differences in what we mean here by holiness. And first of all, let me identify or say this thing about positional holiness. And what do I mean by that? God's separating you from the wages of your sin. For the wages of sin is death. You're a sinner, and because you're a sinner, God must judge your sin, and the wage of your sin must equal death. This is why Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless Lamb of God, died on the, Christ of, uh, the cross of Calvary that he might redeem you from your sin. He paid the wage that you could not pay yourself. And when a person gets saved, they become holy before God. And what do we mean by that? That means Christ's holiness or Christ's righteousness is imputed to you. 
And so positionally, you are holy before God. When you stand before God, he sees Christ's righteousness. The blood of Christ has washed away all your sin. And now you have been given a reward or have given entrance to abide with God for eternity in heaven. God is perfect. God is in heaven. We, we would say God is in heaven. He's everywhere. He's in heaven. If you showed up as a sinner, you would mess it up. But praise the Lord that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, did what you could not do for yourself. And because of that, if you would repent, of your sin, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. And so you are saved from the consequences or from the way, the eternal wages of your sin. We call this grace. But the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans makes it very clear that although you've been given grace, you have not been given a license to sin. And there are many today in many churches today that are preaching a false type of gospel that says, well, listen, you're saved. It's all under grace. You can live and do whatever you want. And beloved, that is hogwash. That's not in the scriptures. And so not only are you, is there a positional holiness, but the New Testament implores believers to a practical holiness. Your walk your manner of life. Practical holiness is a product of your sanctification. And so when you get saved, you are made positionally holy. I mean, you're holy. You're in Christ Jesus. You're in the blood of the Lamb has been applied to your life. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you can try to be practically holy all you want but it will not be enough until you have first been washed by the blood of the lamb and so as you hear this message i don't want you there should be no one in here that should be confused to think that what pastor jason george's is preaching is that you have to be good enough to go to heaven it's impossible and we're not preaching that if you live a holy life that god will let you into heaven that's not what we're preaching at all because the gospel message is that jesus did for you what you could not do for yourself But what is being preached this morning, to those of you that are saved, because you're saved, you ought to live a holy life. Because the blood of Christ has been applied to your life. The idea of holiness ought to make sense to you and ought to be be lived for in your life. It is a product of your, it is the result of your salvation and a product of your sanctification. That you're growing in the knowledge and grace of God. The purpose of sanctification is that the practice of your life may match the position of your soul. Think about that. You have to believe that it must be offensive to God. That there are many that will claim a positional holiness. I'm saved and going to heaven. But have no desire for practical holiness. So I'm going to make the argument. If you're really saved, you would have a desire for holiness. Not, not I'm not saying that you attained it. I'm not saying that you always do it right, but you know better. And you have an inward desire to live a holy life, even though sometimes you don't live up to that estimation. That inward desire, that's not you. That's the Holy Spirit inside of you working himself out. But think about this. How how it must be to God, who his own son, not sparing, died for our sin, costing him the life of his son. Christ buried, died, buried, and risen again gloriously. Amen. And yet there would be people that would have the audacity to claim the name of Jesus, to claim the reward of heaven, and yet have no desire to live holy in their life. Beloved, that stinks to God. It stinks to God. And it ought not be amongst us. And so as we begin this sermon this morning, we ask the question, are you saved? Are you saved? If you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, would you trust him now? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
Before you hear another word, would you even right now in the quietness of your heart say what that preacher is saying is the gospel truth. It's in the Bible. God, I repent of my sin. I know I'm a sinner. And by faith, I trust Jesus alone for salvation. God, would you save me? And the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sin. But if you're here this morning and you are saved, then the Spirit is compelling you to live in holiness. He is. Here's our big idea this morning. You must be determined to live in holiness in an unholy world. Scripture teaches us that personal holiness is important, is instructed, and should be increasing. First of all, personal holiness is important. Look what the Bible says in verse 1 again. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Personal holiness is important. Notice what the Bible says here. Paul was beseeching the brethren, was beseeching the brethren here. He was imploring them. These Christians that were under such opposition, they would have been very easy to say that the least of our concerns right now is personal holiness. And yet Paul was trying to implore upon them, no, the number one concern for you right now in opposition is personal holiness. He refers to them, he beseeches, the Bible says here, the brethren. Personal holiness without salvation is futile. It's futile. And as we said in our introduction, the message this morning is to the brethren. But Paul beseeches you and I that are counted amongst the brethren to live holy, to be concerned with our walk, that holiness to you and I ought to be important. You know, as you look at this passage, you come to understand that holiness is a brotherhood. Isn't that wonderful about a local New Testament church? I mean, holiness is a brotherhood. We are the holy regiment. Uh, we are the holy brigade. We are a brotherhood that is brought together by our common belief and dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ and in our common desire to live a holy life before God. It's a brotherhood. You know, holiness ought to be a brotherhood in a local, local New Testament church. It ought to be in a church that a believer is encouraged unto holiness because it's important to every single one of us. Let me ask you this. Are you in the brotherhood today? I, I mean, I, I'm not talking about are you in the family of God, and I'm not talking are you claiming the rewards of heaven. I'm saying are you taking, when the roll call is, when the, when the roll call is called and, and, and reveille is, is, is sung, uh, is, is blown, and we all line up, are you answering to the call of duty to live holy in your life? Are you a brother with us? Are you a brother with us? You see, holiness is important. Paul beseeched the brethren. And beloved, I beseech you this morning to not take lightly the idea of personal holiness in your life. But not only did he beseech the brethren, Paul invoked the name of Jesus. He invoked the name of Jesus. Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. Hmm. The call for holiness is not only important for the brethren, but Paul invokes the very name of Jesus. For Jesus' sake, for the cause of Christ, for your understanding, because you understand what Jesus has done for you in your life, holiness must be important. Understand this, that holiness without the cross of Jesus in view, will always result in religion. Think about that. See, he's invoking the name of Jesus. He's not saying, be holy for your own self-righteousness. He's not saying, be holy so that you can add some more uh, numbers to your account. He's not be holy so, so that you can earn yourself a, a reward, per se. But what he's saying here is be holy because of Jesus. And, beloved, if, you're gonna, if holiness is going to be important in your life, truly, then the cross of Christ is always in view. 
And so as you think about holiness and as you exercise practical holiness and as you desire to be holy in your, in your life, we always do so with the cross of Christ in view. Why should I be holy? Because Jesus died for me. Why should holiness be important? Because my sin put Christ on the cross. Paul beseeched the brethren. Paul invoked the name of Jesus. But notice this last thing here. He says, even our, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk, and then notice this, to please God. Paul inspired them with God's pleasure. Holiness, number one, is important. Beloved, God wants you to be holy. It's important to him. It's important to him. And notice how Paul inspires them to holiness. Inspiration, or what I mean by inspired, this is a positive reinforcement. But there's been a misnomer that goes around that we can't please God. No, or that God isn't pleased. No, God is pleased, and God is pleased when his children live in holiness. Notice what the Bible says here. In other words, we, have, we beseech you, we invoke the name of Jesus in the manner of life that we have told you, your heart blamable down here, uh, it says that you would walk in holiness. And what is the result of this? Or what is the motivation of this? Or what, uh, what ought to inspire the believer unto this? Because it is pleasing unto God. You ought, holiness, in your, personal holiness in your life ought to be important because it pleases God. Don't you want to please God? It pleases God. God is pleased when his children live in holiness. God is pleased when his children live a life separated from sin, even the appearance of sin, out of love and respect for him. That pleases God. Isn't that amazing to think about? Jesus says in John chapter 15 that we could have his joy and that he might take joy that in abiding with him, that he takes joy in us. Isn't that amazing that Jesus would admit that? What is it amazing? Because so often we think about abiding in Jesus is all about what Jesus could do for us, but that Jesus communicates to us that when we abide with him, he takes joy in that. Why would you not want Jesus to have joy? I mean, that makes sense, right? It's a relationship, not a religion. And a relationship's a two-way street. And so there's this coming together of this relationship. And, and Jesus is for us, and we are for him. And so there is a joy that he has there. And notice what Paul is communicating to the believers at Thessalonica concerning personal holiness. That when believers are concerned that holiness is important, that you would separate yourself not only from sin, but from the appearance of sin, out of love and respect for God, that he is pleased. Now, those of you that are parents understand this. I mean, it, 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 there, is a, there is a pleasure that is derived from children when they show love and respect. Is there not? I mean, your, your children respect your beliefs, respect your wishes, respect your desires, uh, respect your, your commands for them. There, there's an observance. There's, there's a, when your children say, you know what, I kind of want to do this, but mom and dad, you're saying I need to do this. And there's a, a respect of the rules. There's a respect of the expectations. And when that respect is the result of love. Mom and dad, I'm, I'm going to do what you want me to do because I love you. And I want you to be pleased with me. Somewhere along the way, when we stopped preaching about holiness, we have robbed God's people of an opportunity to be pleasing to God and to enjoy the pleasure of God. Now understand this. Because in our, in our wanting to protect the integrity of the gospel, that in grace, that Jesus Christ died for us, and in Christ alone, we have thrown out the baby with the bathwater and saying, and saying that personal holy living is no longer important. And yet Paul is communicating to the saved believers at Thessalonica that God takes pleasure in their holy walk. 
See, holiness ought to be important to you because God is pleased. I wonder if you would be determined in holiness simply for this reason, out of love and respect for him. You know, when you live holy, you're showing God respect. How many of you have this kind of rule? Hey, listen, so long as you're in my house, you're going to do this. So long as you're in my house, you know, when the kids come over to my house, they, you know, they don't, and there's a respect there. Let me clue you into something. You never get to leave his house. (laughs) You're always in his house. You're always in his observation. You're always in his purview. And this is my father's world. It's all his. And beloved, when believers live in holiness, it's not that they're trying to earn something. It's not that they're trying to earn heaven. You know what it is? It's showing a little good old-fashioned love and respect. Love and respect to God. And beloved, God takes pleasure in that. And so, first of all, personal holiness is important. But secondly, personal holiness is instructed, is instructed. Notice what the Bible says there, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God. Look down at verse 2. For we know what commandments We gave you by the Lord Jesus. See, personal holiness is instructed. Let me put some perspective here. Personal holiness should be the result of commandments, not personal preference. Think about that for a second. See, everyone's right in their own eyes. But that's not holiness. Holiness is not right in your own eyes. Holiness is right in God's eyes. Right is not what you think is right. Right is not what you prefer. Right is not your preferences. Righteousness is not the things that you find easy. And the things that you don't find easy, the things that you struggle with, well, those are not as important as the other things. No, no, no. We're not talking about a self-righteousness. We're talking about a righteousness or a holiness that is the result of the commandments of Jesus. See, personal holiness should be the results of commandments, not personal preference. Solomon in the Proverbs said, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. Listen to this. An attempt at holiness without a point of reference, point of reference, will crash you on the rocks of self-righteousness. In other words, holiness demands a focal point. Holiness demands a point of orientation outside of yourself. You cannot be the determination of holiness. Your holiness must be, the the, the definition and the aspiration of holiness must be a fixed point. And that fixed point is God himself. See, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. And so we navigate life or we esteem our conscience on a personal self-holiness, a personal self-righteousness that shows by your map, by your navigation system, that you're always in the right place. But it's fool's gold. You're not in the right place. But rather, the navigation of holiness must have as its fixed point, its north star, the holiness of God. Don't tell me how holy you think you are. Tell me how holy you are in comparison to who God is. And there is your standard of navigating personal holiness. You see, holiness is not intuitive. It is instructed by God. An attempt at holiness without a point of reference will crash you on the rocks of self-righteousness. You must lay your eyes on a target and set your course. 
Peter said, that, report, recorded the word of God as saying, Be holy, for I am holy. God sets himself as the target. God's holiness is a horizon we sail towards but never reach. But in so doing, you will safely cross the treacherous oceans of this world. See, it's the fixed point. So as we esteem to be pleasing to God, we are instructed in righteousness, not by doing what we, or in holiness, not by doing what we think is right, but, but as God has revealed his holiness in his law and his word, God instructs us in holiness, and that's the mark that we sail towards. That's where we set our eyes on the horizon. And it's always on the horizon. It's always out there. But as a good sailor is always sailing for the horizon, he keeps his eyes, not in the swells, because when you look at the swells, you get seasick. And when you look down, you start going in circles, and you're not going straight anymore. So you keep your eyes on the horizon, and there's the horizon of God's holiness. And you're always sailing after that. But it, it's never attainable. But then you look up one day and you realize by going after that mark, striving after God's holiness, never getting there, but always having it before me, that God navigated you through the treacherous oceans of this life. You see, people get caught up and sunk in the storm. Because they take their eyes off the holiness of God and they begin to look on their own self-righteousness and they crash themselves on the rocks of all the perils that are in society and culture today. Beloved, get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes on him and strive after his holiness. And while you may never meet the mark, your attempt for holiness will not go unrewarded. But rather, your determination to live a life that is pleasing to God will help you safely navigate the treacherous waters that we live in today. It will help you find the right path. It will help you bring you. It will protect you from the wiles of the devil. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Are you getting the sailing illustration here with me? So we're sailing, we're on a boat, that's your life. The horizon, that's God's holiness. We're navigating by the, the, his holiness. He's the standard, not our own standard. You get it? But Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The wind and the sails of holiness must be love for Christ. See, that's what has to propel you. The motivation to live a holy life, the motivation to set sail for the horizon must be your love for Christ. Let me give you something practical here. If personal, practical holiness is exhausting in your life, then you're rowing and you're not sailing. Think about that for a second. See, personal practical holiness is not intended to be exhausting. I think sometimes we feel like, man, being, being holy and like living right for God is so exhausting. It's like, it takes so much work and energy and it's like, is it an exhausting thing? Well, listen, you know why? Because you're not allowing the love of Christ to fill the wind of your sails. You're actually rowing the oars of religion. And so you're rowing for this, the horizon that you're never going to meet and you row faster and faster and you get tired and tired and sooner or later you give up on the, on the adventure because you say it's unattainable. But rather, when the love of Christ is filling the wind of your sails, you wake up every morning setting sail on a new adventure over after the holiness of God and you set your sails towards that horizon. And it is Christ's love that motivates you and it is not tiring because Jesus says that his yoke is light and that he gives us rest. And beloved, the believer that is truly right with God, that has the right motive and intentions and is trying to live whole, a holy, practical life with God, actually finds himself in rest. Holiness is restful. Because when you determine that you're going to live holy in your life, you know what you've done? You've stopped trying to wrestle with the world and wrestle with God at the same time. 
That's exhausting. Well, you say, you know what? I'm just going to get in this boat of holiness. I'm going to love Jesus. I'm going to let that guide me and direct me as he reveals himself and instructs me in his word. And I'm going to strive for that. Personal holiness should be the result of commandments, not personal preference. But notice this. It's instructed by God, but Paul instructed them. Paul instructed them in holiness. Paul was fulfilling the commission. Matthew says this, Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. God is the instructor of holiness, but God used Paul to be his mouthpiece. And Paul was fulfilling the great commission in instructing them in the commandments that God has given you. This is what I'm trying to say. A pulpit that does not preach against sin and does not exhort the listener to practical holy living is lying to you. See, holiness is instructed, and it's instructed in the Word of God. That, way, that is why your daily devotions, if they are in the Word of God, will instruct you in holiness. And if the preaching you listen to is in the Word of God, it has to instruct you in holiness. It has to deal with sin. It has to motivate you to holiness. And if it doesn't, and if you're listening to some mealy mouse preacher who never deals with sin, let me tell you this, you're being lied to and he's not preaching you the Bible because the Bible says to be holy. See, personal holiness is instructed. And it's God's people that don't resist that instruction. They actually want it. Preacher, tell me how to be holy. Show me from the word of God areas in my life in which holiness can be increasing and abounding. You have need to be instructed. Paul's concern was that the pressure of the world would overcome, uh, overcome them. They had many voices pulling them in unholiness but only one voice pulling them towards holiness, the Word of God. Beloved, you have many voices that are pulling you towards unholiness, but there's only one voice pulling you towards holiness. And listen, it's not my voice. It's his voice. It's the Word of God. It's not, it's not Pastor Jay versus the world. It's the world versus God. And so when we're preaching the Word of God and we're teaching the Word of God and we're reading the Word of God, it is the Word of God is the singular voice in the believer's life that will compel you to live a holy life. Show me a Christian who is not in the Word, in the word and I will show you a Christian who is not living holy. Because it is the Word that compels you to holiness. <clears throat> One last thought with this on this idea of holiness, personal and practical holiness. If you feel like you are being torn in two, you are attempting to grasp the world and Christ simultaneously. Christ does not intend to rip you apart. He is gentle with you. Christ has no intention to harm you. He only wants your best. He knows more what you need than you know for yourself. He's thought more about you than you've even thought for yourself. He's provided for you more than you could ever provide for yourself. And yet this topic of personal holiness in a believer's life always comes with such consternation. And people feel like, oh, I'm being ripped in two between this world and that world, between, between trying to do right for God and fill the desires of the world. And beloved, what I'm trying to tell you to do this morning in an attempt to live practically holiness is just let go of the world and hold on to God. Stop sailing that way. Stop being torn in two. Stop being so conflicted and confused. Just get settled in your mind that I'm going to follow God. And take his opinion about holiness in your life. Just do what the Bible says. Personal holiness is instructed, but sec thirdly, Paul says that personal holiness is increasing. Notice what the Bible says here at the end of verse 1. So ye would abound more and more. Personal holiness, practical holiness, is a lifestyle, not necessarily a destination. It's a lifestyle. It's who and what you do. 
But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That word conversation is your manner of life. God has called you to a manner of life that is described as holy. In holiness. What we need today is some good old-fashioned getting right and living right with God. That's what we need. We need to become chaste in our conduct. And Paul is going to implore us to this the next time we come to this passage. You need to be right in your actions. You need to be right in your thoughts. You need to be, you need to be right in your relationships. You need to be chaste in your conduct, right in your character, and pure in your charity. We need personal and practical holiness in our lives so that we might live pleasing lives unto God. What we need is just to get right with God. And not getting right so I can get blessed. And not getting right so I can get bailed out of trouble. But getting right because I have offended a big and holy God. God's people need to be impressed with God's holiness once again. And be humbled and broken by that again. And get right with God simply for no other reason. Not to be blessed and not to get bailed out. But simply just to be right with their Savior. And beloved, when we get to that point... Then, then God begins to work in our lives in a powerful, mighty way. See, personal holiness makes us better conduits for God's power. You want to know why you don't have power in God's power in your life? It's because sin is corrupting you. But as we strive for personal holiness and living by the Spirit, we come to understand God's power and see it in our lives. Spurgeon said this way, in proportion as a church is holy, in that proportion will its testimony for Christ be powerful. We want to make a difference in Shiawassee County. We want to have an evangelistic crusade, and we see uh, scores and scores of people come to know Christ as their personal Savior. Then let them see a holy church. Let them see a holy people that are living for God. Personal holiness makes us better conduits for God's power, but lastly, in this idea of it increasing more and more, personal holiness is a protection in a vulgar world. Beloved, holiness protects you. When you determine to live holy, you navigate your relationships better. When you determine to live holy, when temptation comes before you, you are more apt to say no because you realize that's not right and that's not for me and that's not what God has given to me. To rob a believer of the call for personal sanctification and holiness is to rob them of the very tools that will help them to navigate this life for the glory of God. Beloved, holiness is your friend. Holiness is your friend. Determining to live holy for God is your friend. And by testimony of many people, and many of you would give this account, that every self-inflicted wound in our lives is often the result of being reckless in the area of personal holiness. Those times in your life where you got yourself in trouble, those times in your life where you're like, man, can usually be rooted all the way back to there was a moment where you became reckless with holiness and you thought you could handle it. And the Bible says, who can take fire into their bosom and not be burned? And beloved, the Bible says that holiness is a protection for you. God is not a cosmic killjoy. God is not trying to ruin your fun. God is not trying to take all the fun out of this, but God is rather trying to give you joy and, more, and joy more abundantly, peace more abundantly, and God is trying to protect his children, and he implores you to live holy lives. In conclusion, as we think about holiness, and your own personal holiness in your mind. Perhaps the Holy Spirit has already brought some things to mind, and you realize that there are some areas where you just, they're not even growth areas. They're not even areas that you learned something that you didn't know before, but you just know the Holy Spirit convicting. Like, Man, that's not good. I, I shouldn't have that in my life. I shouldn't have that in my home. I shouldn't have that in my character. I shouldn't have that in my relationships. 
It may be a material thing. It may be a, an emotional thing. You, you shouldn't be harboring that bitterness. You shouldn't be harboring that fear. You shouldn't be harboring that anger. It, it may be a material thing, a device, a toy, a, 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 a car, a vehicle, something that you've put and you know that that thing is not what God wanted you to have. And so the Holy Spirit's convicting you, and I, and I, and I wonder, you say, God, I just want to be holy. I want to be right with you practically. I want to live a life that is pleasing to you. I think many of you, just the saying, live holy, already brings floods because you understand and discern the holiness of God, and you're like, man, I, I know. I know what you're talking about, preacher. But I wonder if there might be some of you here this morning who are saying, I don't know what he's talking about. That one won for me. I, I don't. Hold on, let me do a quick. Oh, we're all good. We're all good here. Listen to this statement. The Christian who can no longer discern their own wretchedness has simply gotten used to the stench. So if the topic of God's holiness comes, to your, comes up and no conviction comes in and you put the standard of God's holiness across from your life and you're like, oh, no, pretty good, pretty good, then understand this, that you've just gotten used to the stench. You've just gotten used to being familiar to being in the wallow, to, be, to, being, to being in the manure. You, you, you can't even smell it anymore. Here's a challenge for you this morning. Begin to fill your nostrils with celestial air. Be begin to fill your nostrils with the word of God. Be begin to fill your nostrils by begging and asking God or asking of God to reveal to you his holiness. And as God shows this to you in your life, you will beg God to wash you clean. You must be determined to live holy in an unholy world. Heavenly Father, would you help us?